Thank you for joining us for another lesson from God's Word. The Streetsboro Church of Christ is located at 1386 Russell Drive, Streetsboro, Ohio, 44241. If you're ever in the area, we hope that you'll stop in and worship with us. We hope that you'll enjoy this lesson brought to you by our minister, Ralph Price. Good evening. We began our lesson this morning talking about the devil's tools. The Bible, Paul in Ephesians chapter 6, talks about the wiles of the devil that were to stand against them. Wiles of the devil makes reference to the various tactics and tools that he uses in causing us or trying to cause us to become unfaithful to God. We noticed three of the tools that he uses this morning. We talked about deception and how Jesus described him as the father of lies and how sin is deceitful, promises happiness, but uh, neglects to point out the consequences that are going to come down the road as a result of that sin. We talked about distraction and how the devil can take activities that in and of themselves are just fine and even good and so fulfill our time in our lives with all of these different activities that we no longer have time to serve the Lord because the devil knows that God demands top priority in our lives. So if he can cause us to put God second or third on the list, then he has us. And we talked about dilution, how the devil convinces many to become watered down Christians. In other words, there are different types of Christianity that we mentioned like faith only and works only and undercover Christians and things of that nature where people commit to some extent to becoming a Christian and being a servant of God but they they do that and they they live in a form of Christianity that is incomplete and not not right and therefore the devil has them again and they think that they're all right. Tonight we're going to look at really two more tools, and then my final point is um, sort of a, a, a wrap-up, a conclusion to the whole thing. So we're looking at two more tonight, and then a, a final point. The fourth tool that I want to think about this evening is the tool of depression. Depression. If you look up the word depression, it is a feeling of severe despondency and dejection. The devil is going to do whatever he can. To discourage you. The devil wants you to spend all of your time and all of your mental energy focusing on your trials and the troubles that you endure rather than thinking about the blessings that you have. And he'll dis he wants you to become discouraged by doing that. He has different means by which he can discourage us. Um, first of all, sometimes he'll, he'll start with just telling you or, or making you feel as if you are not good enough. Truthfully, none of us are good enough. And we need to understand that and we need to acknowledge that. None of us are good enough. There's nobody that is good enough except for Jesus. All we can do is learn from our mistakes and try to do better. And so we remember what John told us in 1 John 1 and verse 7. And this is a, a wonderful verse. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. The idea of the blood of Jesus cleansing us from our sins. You see, in that statement, John is acknowledging, implying that there is going to be sin in the Christian's life. And he tells us um, in verse eight or <clears throat> verses 8 and 9 that if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. And so there, we, we're not good enough. We do still have sin in our lives, but our job is to continue to strive to walk in the light, walk according to the teachings of God, and the blood of Jesus will cleanse us from those sins. We learn from our mistakes and try to grow and do better. He'll try the devil as well. Not only will he tell you you're not good enough, he'll tell you you're not doing enough. Again, truthfully, none of us can do enough. There is nothing that we could do that would ever repay what God has done for us, what Jesus has done for us. We just can't do that. All that we can do is the best that we can do. And 
Sometimes, again, we fall short, and all of us can do more than we're doing. But we just need to not give up and keep trying and doing our best. The devil then, uh, if he can't discourage you in that way, he'll try to do it with other Christians. Uh, he'll try to find a way to discourage you by showing you a Christian who isn't living as they ought to be living. Or he'll try to make you feel like you're the one or just a few are doing all the work and none of the other Christians in the Lord's church are devoted and pulling their weight. Um, he'll tempt a Christian to sin and that Christian sometimes will sin and he'll stumble and the devil will use that as a means of discouraging you. Not only then has he discourage the one who stumbled and fell, but also he can use that to discourage other Christians as well. So he'll use the faults, the shortcomings of your brothers and sisters in Christ to try to discourage you and uh, make you feel as if Christianity is not worth the effort. He'll treat you in many ways like he treated Job. When we talk about discouragement, depression, we, we think immediately of Job in the Old Testament. And what ways did the devil use, or what means did he use to try to discourage Job? Well, first of all, there were health problems. I'm not doing these in the order they occurred. But Job experienced health problems. You remember, in one of the discussions that the devil had with God, uh, he had... The devil had already tried to discourage Job, and Job did not deny God. And the devil, or excuse me, God was again talking with the devil and reminded him that Job was still faithful. And, Job, and the devil's response in Job 2, 4 through 7, says, Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. Stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And so one of the ways that the devil tried to discourage Job was by taking away his health. Uh, because he felt that a man would certainly give his life in order to... Uh, have health and that if his health was taken away he would turn against God not only though will he use your health uh, to discourage you sometimes he can use family to discourage you now hopefully we all have faithful Christian families who uh, support us and strengthen us but not all of us have that and I imagine every one of us have family members if not in our immediate family in our extended family who are not Christians and the devil can use that as a way to discourage you. In Job 2 and verse 9, we see him doing that with Mrs. Job. When she says to her husband, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. You remember Job's response. You speak as one of the foolish women. But here we have the devil using his, Job's ungodly wife, or at least she was ungodly in this instance, uh, to try to discourage Job. And if those things fail, another tool that he has that he used against Job is, is death. Not in that he took Job's life, but he took the life of people that Job loved and cared about. You remember back in Job 1, verses 18 and 19, while he was still speaking, he had just received news that um, storms had uh, killed many of his servants and also uh, his, uh, his flocks. But while he was still speaking, one of the servants, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in the oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house and it fell on the young people and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. Think about how that must have felt when Job heard that. It was bad enough that he had lost his possessions and some of his Servants had died as well, but when he hears the news that his children are gone, that they've died, it, it, it really, really hurt him, and he became very discouraged. The devil will use these things to try to discourage you. He doesn't want you to have time to stop and count your blessings. He wants you to focus on your troubles. 
He wants you to focus on the storms of life that rage around us. And that, of course, reminds me of the uh, account when the disciples were out on the Sea of Galilee in the boat in the middle of the night. And, and uh, the boat is uh, being tossed to and fro and they see something on the water and it turns out to be Jesus. And Peter says, Lord, if it's you, bid me to come out from the boat. And, and he does. And Peter steps out of the boat. He begins to walk on the water toward Jesus. And then we read in Matthew 14, 30 and 31, When he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched out his hand and caught him and said to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? What was it that changed? Peter initially is walking on the water. He's doing just fine. But it says that he saw the wind and that it was boisterous. In other words, instead of focusing on Jesus, he began to focus on the storms that were around him. And he began to be afraid. And certainly that can happen to us. And all of us have storms, trials in our lives. And if we spend all of our energy, all of our time focusing on those bad things... And not keeping our eyes focused on Jesus and the ultimate goal and the blessings that he provides. Um, we too will begin to sink in a spiritual sense. The devil will try to convince you that no one has ever had it as bad as you. He'll try to convince you that God has forsaken you. Or that God is angry at you and he's punishing you for something. He'll try to convince you that your brothers and sisters in Christ aren't there for you. That they don't care about you. That you're all alone. Just like Peter, if we take our eyes off of Jesus, if we quit focusing and thinking about the blessings and only think about the trials, we begin to sink. And the devil has us at that point. So depression, or we could say discouragement, is another way the devil tries to lead us away from God. Number five, division. Division. The devil can use division both within and outside the church to discourage Christians. What do I mean division within the church? Well, within the church, um, sometimes there are problems that creep up. There are disagreements that occur between brethren, and the devil can use that within the church. And we know that this happened very early on. In the history of the church, in the sixth chapter of the book of Acts, we read about the fact that there was a problem in the church. And uh, in these days, the number of the disciples was multiplying. There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So there arose a complaint. There began to be some dissension. That would have been another good tool, wouldn't it? Dissension, but it kind of means the same as division. It... it there was a division, there was dissension within the church, and that needed to be dealt with immediately by the apostles, and it was. If it wasn't, that division would have caused greater problems, and undoubtedly some would have probably left the church. We read in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 that there was division in the church in Corinth. Paul says in verses 11 and 12, It's been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. They were dividing themselves over, I don't know, their favorite teacher, or I, I don't know. It's like they thought that they needed to divide themselves after either their favorite teacher or who taught them. We don't know what it is. But there was division in the church of Corinth, and again, Paul, an inspired apostle, jumped right on that because this is a tool that the devil will use to cause Christians to become unfaithful. It's hard really to imagine the amount of damage that has been done in the Lord's church, and I'm not specifically talking about here, but in general, the amount of damage that has been done in the Lord's church over division. It's hard to imagine how many souls have been lost as a result of brothers and sisters who couldn't get along, who couldn't, who couldn't behave civilly toward one another. Well, let me say this. You remember um, one of the watered-down forms of Christianity I talked about this morning was the compromising Christianity, people who will not stand for the truth. 
I'm not saying that we need to avoid division to the point that we're willing to compromise in order to keep the peace. Sometimes division is necessary. Uh, when error creeps in, um, those who remain faithful and will not stand for the error that has come in, there, there may be a need for division to take place in order to maintain the purity of the Lord's church. And we talked Wednesday night, or mentioned Wednesday night in our adult Bible class, that happened in Midway, Kentucky in 1841 when the church there introduced the mechanical instrument into their worship service. There was an immediate division within the Lord's church, and, and those who left should have left because that was against the will of God. It's still occurring today, whether we're talking about instrumental music, and yes, there are still uh, congregations of the Lord's church that are introducing the instrument into worship, whether we're talking about women and leadership roles in the church, or we're talking about congregations of the Lord's church being in fellowship with false churches, all of these things the devil does and is willing to use to cause division, to cause um, discouragement in the Lord's church. So in, or, in some cases, in order for faithful brethren to stay faithful, there, there has to be division uh, from those who are practicing error. But sometimes the division that occurs within the Lord's church is over trivial matters, things that are really matters of opinion, or different personalities with brothers, uh, brothers and sisters within the church, and, and we have individuals who just can't get along. Or maybe there are family squabbles. Or maybe there was someone wrong someone in the past. And so I've heard of instances where there were brothers and sisters uh, in the same congregation who would not sit on the same side of the church. And they, they wouldn't even look at one another. They, they were so angry with one another. The devil certainly uses that to cause Christians to become unfaithful. Now, that's just within the church. Uh, problems that creep up within the church that lead to division, that cause brothers and sisters to fall away. If we're thinking about outside the church, the devil uses religious division to keep people outside the church. That's one of the tools that he uses. Um, and that is so effective for so many different reasons or in so many different ways. Religious division in the world is one of the things that keeps many people from even bothering with religion. And the man who, who baptized me, the brother who baptized me, his name's Don Treadway. Some of you know him. We had him here many years ago for a gospel meeting. Um, he, he tells the story that that was why he was not interested in religion. Because there was so much division. There were... Christians over here who believed one thing and Christians over here who believed another thing. And his whole line of thought was, if they can't figure it out and agree, why would I want to try to be a part of that? I can't figure it out if they can't figure it out. And so there are many people like that who, when they look at the division in the religious world, they throw up their hands in disgust and say, if they can't agree, if they can't figure it out, why even bother? with religion. And then on top of that, the devil also is able to use that division because, especially as you think about denominationalism, you have people in these different groups, in these different man-made churches who all feel as if they're okay. They're a member of a church. They call themselves Christian and they do some good in the church. And so not only can he use that division to keep some people from even trying to be faithful, he can use that division to convince people who actually do want to go to heaven and believe that there is a God and Jesus is his son, but he uses that to convince them that they're okay and that they are in a right relationship with God. Jesus, he knew that division was going to be one of the primary problems that the church would face. And again, when you study Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, the longest prayer we have recorded of our Savior, this, on the night that he was going to be betrayed, his focus was on his disciples and what was going to happen to them when he was gone. 
And throughout that prayer, he talks about unity and how it is his desire that there be unity among his uh, followers. If you, and if you just look at verses 20 to 23, Jesus here says, I do not pray for these alone, meaning just his you know, 12 disciples, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. That's you and I, all Christians. That they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me and have loved them as you have loved me. So there, again, if you notice, he says that he, he prays for unity among his followers, that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. You know, in the religious world, the idea of unity and what unity is has really been perverted and distorted. And now it seems the only thing required for unity among believers is, do you acknowledge God and that Jesus is his son? And if you do, then we're in unity with one another. That's not the type of unity that Jesus is discussing because these folks that say that there's unity, they teach different things, they practice different things, they disagree on fundamental doctrinal issues. Jesus says he wants the unity that exists among believers to be the type of unity that existed between him and the Father. They didn't uh, simply agree to disagree on things. They were in full agreement, full cooperation, full fellowship with one another. And again, notice that he said he desired that unity that the world may believe that you sent me. There at the end of verse 21. And then in verse 23, and that the world may know that you have sent me. So again, what is one of the major causes of people not even trying to figure out religion? It's the division that exists in the world. The fact that there is divisions, it causes many people to throw up their hands and say that, you know, Christianity is just a hoax because people can't agree. You've heard people say things like, you can prove anything by the Bible. And so they don't even try to learn and discern the truth. So division is another major tool. We've talked about depression and division tonight to go with the other three we mentioned this morning. But now I want to, I guess... As we conclude the lesson, my last point is that the devil's aim, the devil's goal is your destruction. That's what he wants. He wants to destroy you. You see, the devil has already been defeated by God. It, and it was no contest. It wasn't even difficult for God to defeat the devil. While Jesus was here on the earth, he demonstrated his power over Satan. He demonstrated his power over the servants of Satan, the demons that uh, inhabited people. When Jesus died on the cross, the devil undoubtedly believed that he had won a great victory. I'm sure he believed that. He thought, I've done it. I, I've defeated him. I've put him to death. But God turned that into his greatest victory when Jesus rose from the dead. So the devil's days are numbered. He's been defeated. The price for sin has been paid. The devil one day is going to be cast into hell for all eternity, never to come forth again. And so the devil is motivated by a deep hatred of God. And therefore he hates everything that God loves. And so the best way for the devil to hurt God is to, to attack that which God loves. That which God loves, the devil is going to try to destroy. What are some of the things that God loves? Well, you, you think about it. God created the family. The devil's trying to destroy the family. And uh, that family unit that, that he established in the very beginning with Adam and Eve, uh, now, you know, we're told that it's perfectly okay for there not even to be a family or that two men can be married or two women or whatever it might be. And so he's trying to destroy the family. He's trying to destroy 
the state. In, in other words, uh, we know that God has ordained the civil authorities and he, he likes, he needs for there to be a government in place. Romans chapter 13. Well, the devil, he attacks that. He, he tries to uh, put rulers in place that will not adhere to the law of God. And so he's attacking that. He's uh, trying to destroy the thing that matters probably more than anything else to God, and that is the church. He's trying to destroy it. The church that was purchased with the blood of Jesus, Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. And he's seeking to destroy your soul. We think about the words of the Apostle Paul in 2 Thessalonians 1, verses 8 and 9. And, and we're going to conclude on this verse. Here Paul says that when Jesus returns, it will be in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and the glory of his power. That's the devil's purpose. That's his aim. That's the only thing that will give him any happiness is to know that he's taken something which God loves, which God values, and that is your soul. And by his influence and your submission to his influence, that is going to be destroyed on the day of judgment when Jesus comes back. Therefore, understand that the devil has been defeated. The price for your sins has been paid. Do not focus on the storms and trials of your life as we've been talking about. And do not allow the devil to cause you to be discouraged by division that might occur within the Lord's church. But rather focus in uh, on God's word and his will for your life and strive to obey him. Knowing that at times you will stumble and you're not good enough. But you can grow and you can be do better than you're doing now in your life or in your relationship with God. So as we conclude our lesson tonight, if there are any here who have yet to obey the gospel of Jesus, know that the devil right now is trying to get you to stay in your seat. He does not want you to respond to this invitation. But friend, if you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, won't you please repent of your sins, turn from them, and begin following Christ. Confess your faith in Him, be baptized as he commanded that your sins might be washed away. We're going to sing a song, and as we sing it, if, if you want to become a Christian this morning, defeat the devil by obeying the will of God. If you believe, then why not obey? Most of us have already obeyed, but maybe you've become discouraged by one thing or another, or uh, you've, just, you've become unfaithful by allowing sin back into your life. If that's the case... We ask you to come back. The Lord asks you to come back by repenting of the sin in your life and seeking his forgiveness, and he will give it. If there's any way we can help, please come as we stand and sing. Thanks for listening. If you have any questions or comments, Ralph can be reached at rprice at streetsboroughchurch.org or by calling 330-626-4282. If you would like to learn more about the Church of Christ, we offer free Bible correspondence courses by mail and home Bible studies. We hope that you enjoyed this lesson. Feel free to come visit us. We would love to have the opportunity to meet you.